good evening. We'll start with the prayer. End, end time timeline of feasts and the eschatology, which means the end time significance and the end time happenings. We are all excited about Russia, which is the beginning of a harvest of grapes, which is the last harvest of Israel. Uh, but we want to cover in sequence how the harvest was related to the feasts and every one of the feasts, some have been fulfilled in the life of Christ in the first coming and others will be fulfilled in the uh, coming of Christ for the second time. So Father, in these uh, adventurous days, we are asking the Holy Spirit to guide us with your word and into our spirit, the urgency of the times that the Passover and the Feast of Pentecost and every other feast that points to Christ and the recurrence of these feasts every year in Israel in anticipation of the coming Messiah and for the preservation of that nation. And we know for the preservation of the holy nation in Christ and our uh, being with him is an important time for us. So the expectation, the occupation and the preparation. Shall we say together expectation? All together, expectation. Expectation. Occupation. Occupation. And the preparation. And the preparation. Yes. Now, shall I ask Hiranthini to introduce or do I understand how the harvest moved from Passover? sheaf of first fruits, the loaves and grain harvest, wheat harvest, and then finally to the grape harvest. Yes, we are ready to listen. Um, so um, can you hear me? Yes. So today's uh, Bible today's Bible study will be in, um, I just show you the overview. Uh, so we'll be talking about the timeline of feasts and the times we live in. Uh, so it's starting with the timeline of feasts. If I may ask you now, as I was preparing for this, I had um, kind of, uh, I had not known much about this feast. So I learned uh, through the process of preparation. And so I would, uh, like to ask you, so what nation or people were the feasts given to? Israel? Yes, yeah, so yes. Yeah. So we yes. see in Leviticus 23, the Lord spoke again to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, The Lord's appointed times, which you shall proclaim as holy convocations. My appointed times are these. So this was given to the nation of Israel as part of their law to be celebrated each year. So they are known as feasts of Israel. So it's not given to any other nation, nor were they given to the church. So the Lord's appointed times. So next question is, in the Bible, when was the first feast mentioned? Of the Passover? Yes. So, so the first uh, mention is when Israel as a nation was preparing to leave Egypt in Exodus. We all know the Passover and unleavened bread, and it's mentioned in Exodus 12. After that, the full instruction for all the feasts were given by God to Moses when the law was given at Sinai. Okay, so this I didn't know as well. Uh, so can we, you, anyone name all the feasts in order? The timeline order. Yes, or if you can mention even the feasts, that's fine. Before we go to the names, how many feasts were there? Four, no? Seven. Seven. Anything with God, we can think about the perfect number. Yeah. Uh, so seven, that's right. So any names of the feast? Actually, I also didn't know. So 
the feast uh, of so first food, the feast yes. of trumpets. Yes, trumpets, Passover, Passover, yes. tabernacles. Passover. Right, right. So, so here are the seven feasts and the Hebrew names are given uh, within brackets. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost or weeks, uh, trumpets, atonement and tabernacles. As I was studying this, I really found it very fascinating and how the timelines uh, have been made by God so many years ago. And this was a real eye opener. So what is the spiritual purpose in giving these feasts? So if we, so it's actually, yes, it's an aspect of the Jewish history and part of their history, but God has given us, a, uh, given the people of God a far greater reason and also a far outreaching reason for this feast. So these feasts foretell us in advance the work of his son, Jesus Christ, in specific his death, resurrection and his return. So if you put it this way, so it's actually really amazing to see how he has been so specific and even giving the exact days of the year in which these events will occur. So they are God's calendar for the order and details of the most significant events in the history of the world. So may I explain to you the fees that we spoke of? So we spoke of seven fees. And it's very interesting to find that there are spring feasts and there are autumn uh, feasts. So it's towards the end. So in the Jewish calendar, spring starts somewhere in March. So civil <coughs> calendar starts in January. The Jewish calendar will start somewhere in March and uh, March, February. So that's where the spring feasts start. So there are four spring feasts. The Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, Feasts of Weeks or Pentecost. And then there are three fall feasts. That's the autumn feast. That's towards the end. That's about somewhere in October. The feasts of the trumpets, atonement and tabernacles. Between these two groups of feasts, there is a gap. So we are going to see why, why are these timings important and about this gap. So that's about four months. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, so four feasts uh, in the spring depicts Jesus's first coming. That is the death, resurrection of Christ and sending of the Holy Spirit. We see that this all, this has been fulfilled. The three in the autumn, these depict the events at the end of the age, the rapture, resurrection, the second coming of Christ, and the long-awaited messianic kingdom on earth. So the four-month gap in between, which I spoke earlier, this, is, this separation signifies the two comings of Jesus Christ, and it's the church age. So combining these feasts speak of the total work of Christ to redeem mankind and this planet, and it's all laid out in advance. So I was really um, fascinated by uh, these. So our believers, so just going out of it a little bit, do our believers in Christ told to keep the feast today? So this is also another interesting question. So church is not under any law to outwardly keep the feast as the nation of Israel was told to. In fact, there are verses that warn against believers going back to these aspects of the law in an attempt to win favor and righteousness with God. So Galatians, I have mentioned the scripture here. Uh, so where Paul advises or warns the Galatians about keeping this feast. Uh, so we are not under any legal obligation to keep this feast because they were a shadow of the reality that is in Christ. But as shadows or types, we can certainly learn from them for God has hidden many important truths within them. So we will, in the next couple of minutes, um, we will be unfolding these, the hidden, hidden truths. 
So it should be noted that there is a spiritual way in which we still keep this peace, but not in an outward uh, kind of way. So, um, so the scriptures have been given here about not doing it in an outward manner. So what should we then focus on as we study this feast? So as I said, the feast were shadows of the reality of uh, Christ. So we focus on the reality in Christ. And it's not mere uh, getting up, like knowing or gathering knowledge. It's not for just gathering of the knowledge, but there is a huge significance of this feast. So going into detail, the nitty gritty details, the finer points, unless it has a significance uh, to our life and our Christian life now, it will not be of value. So there are three significant aspects of the feast. So one is the messianic significance. So this is the work of Christ at his first coming, as well as what he will be doing leading up to his return and the kingdom rule. The other significance is the personal significance. So this is the spiritual outworking of the truth of this peace into our lives today. So these are the two points that are actually summed up in the term, the reality that is in Christ uh, when we talk about the feast. What exactly is a feast? So in Leviticus 23 verse two, um, you can see it here in the first bullet I have mentioned here, it says, speak to the Israelites and say to them, these are my appointed feasts the appointed feast of the Lord, which you are to proclaim as sacred assembly. So I found that there are two important words, feast and assemblies here. So when we talk about feast, the first thing that comes to my mind is lots of food and, uh, and not even lots of food, various kinds of food. But here in Hebrew, it says here moed, means an appointment. So it's a fixed time. It's a fixed season. So it's a specific festival. And the next word is assemblies. And some versions also have mentioned as convocations. So something like a gathering or it's like a public meeting. So you can see here, God was setting up a fixed time during the year when the nation of Israel was called out to gather together every year to rehearse future coming events. You can see every year they had to repeat it. So God would not get them to repeat year after year unless it was important. So we can see here how much God had thought about uh, these feasts and included them and how important it is. So moving on, I would like to now give you an overview of the feast. So on the left hand side of the column, you can see the feasts have been listed out. So you can see the first four feasts, Passover, Unleavened Bread, Sheaf of First Fruits, Pentecost, which is also called the Feast of First Fruits and of a Feast of Weeks. Then we have the gap I spoke about. So that is the ingathering of the wheat harvest. It's not a feast. I have put it in another color. It's that the gap period that we talked about between the two groupings of feasts. Then we have the trumpet, atonement, and tabernacle. So here I have in the, the columns on the right side, the historical significance, messianic significance, personal significance, and the eschatological significance has been given. So this will be in the next couple of minutes, we will be discussing some of these in detail. Passover and unleavened bread. Um, so as you know, Passover was the freedom from slavery of Egypt, and then the lamb slain and the blood applied. And then the messianic significance was, was that Jesus death as the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And what is it to us personally? We are delivered. We, have, we are brought into the family of God and we are redeemed. So that is the significance to us. And then uh, 
in the second coming, the blood calls for accountability, vengeance of the blood. And next, uh, the second one is unleavened bread. So here, the Israelites left Egypt in haste. And this will um, is significant as Jesus' sinless life and his burial, partaking of Christ's life. And for us, it is the walk with God, being free from the leaven of sin that corrupts us. And God calls us in the end times to holiness. So that's in Revelation 3. So this is an overview, as I said. So we'll be going into more details in, uh, in a few minutes. Then comes the sheaf of first fruits. So initially at the Passover, uh, when the Egyptians left, uh, sorry, the Israelites left Egypt, uh, there was Passover and unleavened bread happened together. But later on, the sheaf of first fruits was added in between these two. So it was a, a feast that came up later. So first fruits of the harvest celebrates the crossing of the Red Sea and Jesus' resurrection from the dead as the first fruits of the new creation is symbolic. And then for our significant, for, for personal life application, we are to live a newness of life, leaving that which is behind us. So we cross over and we become a new creation in Christ, offering ourselves back to him. And this, uh, this uh, shadows the great end time revival. So where there is great harvest. The fourth one, Feast of Pentecost or Feast of First Fruits or Feast of Weeks. So this happens 50 days after the First Fruits where there's new grain uh, and wave loaves, which we'll be learning again. So this is the remembering the giving of the law on Sinai. So it symbolizes in the New Testament, the coming of the Holy Spirit that dwells in, dwells in, our, in the believer. So again, we'll be talking about the uh, Feast of Pentecost. And so we... As Christians, as new uh, covenant believers, we are to walk in the fullness of the Holy Spirit, following the law of the spirit of life. And we are baptized into one body and we are preparing. So in the, in the second coming, we are preparing in the preparation for his coming. So preparation of the bride, gathering of the body is what symbolizes the Pentecost. So we'll be going into details. And then we have this gap here, which we talked about earlier, the church age, where it continued from. So, in, so you can see here the first four feasts and the typos have been fulfilled. And now it is a church age and where there was witnessing, there's evangelism, souls being saved. However, towards the end, there's tribulation. But there is a great harvest as well that has been promised. Uh, so next we move on to the autumn uh, feast. Those are the trumpets, they have atonement and tabernacles, which have not been fulfilled as yet. So the feast of trumpets, again, it is uh, the Jewish, it's a Jewish new year, celebrates the creation of the world. So it's something new. And, for, and um, in the New Testament, it depicts the rapture and resurrection of believers and crowning of King Jesus. So what should we do at this time? So, so we'll be talking a lot about this, about watchful waiting, warfare, living in view of his imminent return and being ready. So that is the day of the Lord, trumpet and judgment. So this is also a very interesting aspect. Uh, then next comes the day of atonement. This is the holiest day and national forgiveness. And again, it's in New Testament, it's the second coming of Christ in power and where Israel will be forgiven. And we also call to live a life of repentance before the Lord and yielding ourselves um, up to him. So not it's not a one-off event, but it's a lifestyle of repenting before the Lord. Um, the final one, the Feast of the Tabernacles. So this is uh, the historical significance was the celebration of the promised land. So there's a new destiny. The thousand year messianic kingdom, the millennium is the New Testament significance. So we are to rest, living in the rest and joy that is in Christ in our daily lives today. So our pre pre um, walking with the Lord, being fruitful while on earth. So that is the personal significance. Um, so that's an overview about 
the fees and then we move on to the specific fees and its relevance. So again, this is an uh, another way of uh, uh, depicting the seven fees. So you can see here with the dates that have been given. Um, so yeah, so we'll continue. Yes, I take over. Correct? Yes. Uh, Eddie, my slides. Yes. I want to read 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Clean out the old leaven. So in the feast of Passover, which was the first feast, and that was before the Sabbath, and the day after the Sabbath was the sheaf of first fruits. So Jesus died at the Passover, and then there was the Sabbath, and early morning three ladies went, and they found the sheaf of first fruits resurrected. Uh, I want the uh, I want the tables Eddie, the first tables. Uh, so clean out the old leaven. When they got ready for the Passover, they cleaned out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump. This is a great, uh, what shall I say, expectation and joy and hope. However much leaven has worked in us, when it is taken out, the miraculous power of Christ gives us a new lump, a new lamp. All things pass away, all things become new. We are made a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Never mind whether we have lived with 11 for 12 years, 24 years, 36 years, 48 years, or more than that, we become a new lump. Just as you are, in fact, unleavened. For Christ, our Passover also has been sacrificed, done and finished. That is why we can't resurrect any of those feasts now. We do, we undo the work of Christ. Uh, New Testament is very clear. Any, uh, this was a great battle in Galatia. Uh, epistle to the Galatians tackled this. Any amount of, any measure of Old Testament feast redoing. We are undoing Christ and we don't want to undo Christ. For Christ, our Passover has been sacrificed, done and finished. Similarly, every feast is done and finished. And we have the spiritual benefit of it. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now, if you look at this slide, uh, you will find a closer view of uh, some of the things Iran Thini mentioned. Passover is found in Leviticus 23, 4 and 4. It was on the 14th of Nisan. So the first Passover on the day of the Passover, the angel of death passed over. Will you say with me, passed over? Passed they over. Were, yeah, they were inside the doorpost and lintel marked with blood. The Passover lamb was separated on the 10th of Nisan. It's on the 10th of Nisan that Jesus entered Jerusalem for the last time. And in our calendar, what day was that? Tenth of Nisan in our calendar. What's the day we celebrate Jesus entering? Palm Sunday, correct? Yes. Uh, so 14th of Nisan. Uh, but they separated the lamb on the 10th, kept the lamb till the 14th night, and they slaughtered the lamb, a lamb for a family. Thank God, now everyone does not have to slaughter a lamb for the family, because Jesus Christ, the lamb of God, John 1, 29, was sacrificed for all the families of the earth. Uh, so, Type of New Testament reality is 
lamb of god crucified now in the end time how does it get applied last call of mercy by the blood is now being sounded forth in earnest by the lord that's what the church feels that we must give the call of the blood of jesus speak salvation witness to everybody revelation 12 11 has come to us these times that by the word of by the blood of the lamb and by the word of god that we have to overcome so the jurisdiction of the blood pleading of the blood living inside the blood uh, and offering the uh, salvation of the blood has become urgent and uh, ukrainian invasion on the underscores the urgency we already were feeling last call of the mercy of the blood at this point i like to point out in revelation chapter 5 john was weeping because he was wondering what will happen to the plan of redeeming the nations in revelation chapter 1 verse 5 we are we are told how important we are from jesus christ the faithful witness the first born of the dead ruler of the kings of the earth who loves us and re- released us from our sins and he has made us to be a kingdom of priests to his god and father to him and by his blood a kingdom of priests so when the end time has neared in revelation chapter 5 the lamb of god slain from the foundation of the world stands up and i saw revelation chapter 5 verse 6 so turn your bible quickly revelation chapter 5 verse 6 and i saw between the throne with the four living creatures Uh, and the elders a lamb standing as it slain having seven horns and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of god sent out into all the earth so lamb has stood up is there any time in the scripture someone saw the lamb standing quickly you get a chocolate if you say it quickly abraham stephen lamb stand uh, yeah that is that is a literal lamb on mount moriah good i am speaking about excellent the lamb of god jesus christ standing did anyone see that stephen big upon stephen correct correct well done stephen uh, so the lamb stands up at this time uh, because these are the last days of the blood of jesus speaking pleading Uh, so the lamb stands up and he came up and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne simultaneously simultaneously from every nation we find we find the heavenly scene getting ready for this time simultaneously uh, revelation chapter 5 verse 12 where is the lamb that has stand to receive power and riches and wisdom might and honor and glory and blessing to, uh, then from every nation uh, revelation 9 and 10 you have made them to be a kingdom and priest to our god and they will reign upon the earth so so this is a time the royal priest to out of god must must arise and say what jesus has claimed by his blood nations the people of the nations households you and your household shall be saved at 1631 then jesus sprinkled every nation with his blood when he was on the cross uh, isaiah 52 15 which means all the resources of every nation jesus has already redeemed by the blood to become the heritage and inheritance of god's people so psalm 2 says ask of me the nations this is the time that christians must say give us our nation o oh lord and how the ukrainian christians were praying isn't it that they will not go through this torture uh, ukraine is the most christian country as far as the number of believers are concerned they they are they far outnumber any other european nation in christianity uh, so every na- in every nation this is the time we are praying and saying lord the blood what you have redeemed with your blood and uh, we we can exercise we can redeem the gems the gem industry of sri lanka out of all the bloody happenings by bringing it under the blood of jesus we can re- redeem 126 rivers of sri lanka by bringing it under the blood of jesus christ so this involves 
uh, witness, worship, and walking the ways of the Lord. Three Ws. Witness, worship, and walking the ways of the Lord. And worship includes, of course, prayer and intercession. So we can speak of the, uh, the, the tea industry, rubber, coconut, every industry, the demonics to go away, corruption to go away, and all the wealth of the nation that has been robbed return in Jesus' name. Vomit out. We give a emesis that under the blood of Jesus Christ, all the wealth of the nation returns. We have to rule by the blood of Jesus Christ. Then uh, unleavened bread, feast of unleavened bread began on the Sunday that the sheaf of first fruits was offered. They did not call it Sunday. But all over the Old Testament, the day after the Sabbath is a very important uh, word. In the KJV, the morrow after the Sabbath. So on the morrow after the Sabbath that came after Passover, they offered a sheaf of first fruits. That was from the barley harvest. It was a roasted one sheaf. Remember, it was only one sheaf. One sheaf, S-H-E-A-F, from the barley harvest. And it was, it was given as a wave offering before the people. Because that sheaf of first fruits was for the people to receive the life of Christ. That was the idea. They did it like this. Uh, that is the sheaf of first fruit offered on the day after the Sabbath. Speaking of the resurrection of Christ. Uh, then we are promised in Acts 3.22 there's going to be a restoration of all what the Lord gave the New Testament church. We know down the centuries much was lost. But Acts 3.22 promises a restoration for the church of what the New Testament church was given. Acts 3. 20, X3, 22, uh, X3, 21. Whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things, about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. Now, heaven received Christ. Now, heaven must receive Christ and then the period of restoration and then Christ comes back. Uh, so the Feast of Unleavened Bread started on the Sunday, day after the Sabbath and went on for seven days. Now, note that that bread did not have leaven. So it's a call for holiness is strong these days that we will get rid of the leaven. Now, uh, we will move on to the Passover, quickly glean some points, and then Hiranthini will take over for the Feast of Pentecost. Next slide. Next slide. This month shall be to you the beginning of month. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So we know when we came to Christ, it became a new year to us. It's a new beginning. And that's what so passed overnight had a plague going around. So COVID has come and went around. But God's people were asked to stay indoors between the doorpost and the lintel. Will you do it me? Doorpost and the lintel. So the blood was applied on the doorpost and the lintel. What were they draw drawing when they did that? Blood was applied on the doorpost and the lintel. What were they doing? Blood was applied on the doorpost and the lintel. What were they doing? Cross. They were drawing the cross, though they did not know what they were doing. So when Jesus Christ came the first time, they wanted to make him king and was very angry. He was not available for that. They missed the fact that there were two sets of prophecies about a servant Messiah who would die, which is best expressed in Isaiah 53 and a kingly messiah who would come to reign. They missed the gap that Hirantini spoke about between the suffering of the messiah 
and coming as the reigning king, there would be a gap, which is the gap of the harvest, gap of the church age. Uh, so they expected a king at the first time itself. So, uh, so this is the Passover night. And I find world circumstances are becoming like that. Plague spreading, pharaohs getting very, what shall I say, uh, very, uh, uh, very harsh. And religious powers also will now begin to mix with politics. Many don't know that uh, Putin has religious fervor for the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, that one major reason for invading Kyiv is that Kyiv was the place where the Russian people were first baptized in the river. The, all the Russian population in 998 BC, when they separated from the Catholic Church, the Emperor of Constantinople acknowledged them and uh, they were all uh, baptized uh, again. So Kiev is the spiritual capital of the Russian people. I'm just giving you a background of Putin's religious fervor. He has built the Russian Orthodox Church and he's criticizing the West saying West has given up uh, morality and he wants to rebuild, uh, re rebuild uh, Christian morality. Now, I'm only saying how his religious fervor pushed him into uh, political action and war. Then we know there is another figure that will arise, demand worship. We can see that in Revelation 13. He will not come out of the Slav people. He will come out of the people of the prince to come. That I will do under Daniel chapter 9. Uh, so, the, uh, the bishop at that time was Vladimir, the bishop of Ukraine. So, Lenin was Vladimir Lenin, and Putin is Vladimir Putin. So, you can see how religious shadows cast very strong effects on political belief. That's what Revelation 17 and 18 also says. So the, the, in the end time, there are going to be two forces who are religiously motivated. One is identified as uh, the king of the north. Other one has no particular name, but uh, the people, the, that force is called people of the prince to come. That prince is not the messianic prince. That prince is the anti-messianic prince. So in these days, we find when shadows are lengthening, darkness is deepening, uh, the Lord is asking us to witness to the blood of Jesus Christ and strictly live within the doorposts and the lintel that he gives. Don't try experiments. Don't try strange doors. He will secure a door no man can shut. And when you are within that door and in that territory, finances, health, economics, the, the, the future of our children will be under the blood of Jesus Christ. The technical word is under the jurisdiction of the blood of Jesus Christ. Consciously plead the blood of Jesus Christ. Consciously visualize being inside the doorpost and the lintel of the blood of Jesus governing our life. Uh, in Israel, the religious year First month is called Nizan. That's how they lived till they went into exile in 586. When they returned from exile, they began to observe a civil year like other nations. Then Nizan would come between our end of March and April. So that's how Passover now comes between either end of March or beginning of April. And then the, the original seventh month in the religious year became the 10th month in the civil year. Uh, but when they do religious feasts, they still keep their original uh, religious year. So the first of the seventh month 
which is called Tishri, is the Feast of Trumpets. Tenth of the seventh month is the Day of Atonement. Fifteenth of the seventh month is the Feast of Tabernacles. Next slide. Exodus, because of a new beginning, speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, in the tenth of this month, they shall take to each man a lamb for a, uh, for a father's house, a lamb for a house. Thank God we don't have to take a lamb for a house. The pastoral lamb is Jesus Christ, the lamb of God is for every, all the houses in the world, every person. And John said, seeing Jesus coming, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Next slide. A chosen lamb was committed to death on the 10th of Nisan. Jesus Christ entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday on the 10th of Nisan. Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year you shall take from the sheep or from the goat, a type of Christ. Yes. Next slide. Speak to all the congregation of Israel on the 10th of this month. They are each to take a lamb for themselves. Moreover, they shall take of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the house in which they eat. Now you shall eat in this manner with your loins girded, your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Why eat it in haste? Because we are quickly going to make a journey out of Egypt. That's what Passover meant. Next slide. Night of Passover in the midst of plague, quite like COVID time. God's people are again drawn to a careful walk where the blood will protect. Only walk through blood-sprinkled doorways. Unbelievers fearing the angel of death will find sanctuary in the tents of the righteous. We will witness and overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Next slide. Every believing house takes the Lamb and the blood in earnest. You shall be saved and your house. Cleanse their home of old leaven, so please uh, don't keep artifacts of old life, sinful life, uh, even if it's fashionable. Just check out everything in these days. Pharaoh and taskmasters and religion, economics will unite for a frontal assault on the church. But that night, back wages of 400 years of slavery were given to Israel. So we expect uh, there would be wealth transfer from darkness to light. Next slide. For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. So when days of mercy under the blood of Jesus pleading is ending, are ending, you will find days of vengeance beginning. So we are in a transition time. Before days of vengeance gets unbearable, Christ will come and take up to himself. But already we can see with the Ukrainian trouble, what will be next? Is Israel safe? Is Taiwan safe? What will happen to the Baltic countries? Now, a few hours ago, Putin threatened, uh, Putin threatened Finland uh, saying, if you join the, uh, if you join NATO, take care. Uh, so uh, days of vengeance are beginning. Man has started it, really not God. The play, COVID plague, man started it. But you can see the times have changed, and the nations have now decided. You will presently see from John chapter, uh, Joel chapter three, again to make swords out of plowshares. Who is the prophet who said they will make plowshares out of souls? Joel? Which prophet prophesied it? Yes? Pardon? Who is the prophet who said That's they will Joel. make so they will turn swords into plowshares? Who said that? Yes. Isaiah. Isaiah. Very good. Isaiah 2 4. And on that verse, UN at the end of the Second World War made their axiom Man shall learn war no more. Joel 3 verse 6 says, The time will come 
mind you, Joel was before Isaiah. Isaiah was 740 BC, Joel was 800 BC. Joel says a time will come when, when nations will want to make swords out of plowshares and spears out of pruning hooks. See how much the prophets knew, how much they saw, how much their prophecies dovetail into each other. And presently we will see the gray harvest of overripe grapes, the wine press of the wrath of God, described in Revelation 14, is very well described, similarly described in Joel chapter 3. How much the prophets saw. So when we read scriptures, the fear of the Lord, the reverence of the Lord comes to us and we get uh, motivated to keep looking at scriptures. I think now uh, I have done all I... Next slide, just let me have a look. Yes. So it came about at midnight, the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, the firstborn of Pharaoh, and there was a terrible death wail. And Pharaoh said, go, go, go. Deliverance came. Next slide. Yes. Now I will stop here and hand it over back to uh, Hiranthini for the next feast. Um, so moving now, we spoke about the Passover, unleavened bread, and the first fruit. So, those are the spring feasts. And if you can see in this um, table, the months that have been described here, uh, because that's important for just to remember, not to memorize, that it was the month of Nisan and Sivan. And then you can see here the gap. That was a feast uh, for the church age. And then the Tishri. So that is the, where the feast of the trumpets began uh, or celebrated in this the month of Tishri. Uh, so now we move on to the feast of Pentecost. Uh, so you, in Leviticus 23, verses 15 to 12 mentions and describes the Feast of Pentecost. I have highlighted here a few points. Uh, so, so this is celebrated from the day after the Sabbath, 50 days, and we talk about that in a minute. So it mentions here, from where you live, bring two loaves made of two tenths of an ephah of fine flour baked with yeast or leaven as a wave offering of first fruits to the Lord. If you go to verse 20, where I have highlighted in orange, the priest is to wave the two lambs before the Lord as a wave offering together with the bread of the first fruits. So that is, let's see what the significance of it is. Um, so count 50 days from the day of after the Sabbath, which was the feast of the first fruits. Uh, so until the next feast takes place. So Pentecost means 50. Um, so what they did was they counted 50 days, uh, which begins on the day after the Sabbath, the Sunday following the Passover. So it starts and ends on the first day of the week. So that is a Sunday. So that is very relevant to us living in the New Testament time because Jesus rose on the first day of the week. The Holy Spirit came on the first day of the week. So church began officially on the first day of the week. So it all speaks of new life and a new beginning. Uh, so this was a celebration of the wheat harvest that was coming to a close at this time. So that is the historic background. Now, in the previous passage, I highlighted the num the, and you'd have seen that number two is very important. So two wave offerings to the Lord, two loaves and two lambs. So if you can think about this, uh, the two loaves of bread and that contain leaven. So what does leaven uh, depict?
But do you usually know about leaven? Because unleavened bread did not have leaven. Yeah, unleavened bread means no leaven. So, what does usually leaven depict? Or what is sin. it? Sin. Sin. Yeah, it's the sin. So, now, could you think why would this offering, why would God include leaven in this feast? Right? So, that is important. And um, another thing is, another significant point is uh, that this is going to be a special Sabbath. So, let's start solving the problem. So, the, in the Feast of Pentecost, what we need to note down is, it's a specific prophetic fulfillment of this day. 50 days uh, to the feast. Then there was a wave offering with two loaves and two lambs. The leaven was included in the loaves as well as pine flour. And there was a, and this was uh, a special Sabbath uh, day. So it's very clear to us and it's given in the scripture. The specific day on which this feast met its fulfillment is on the day of Pentecost following the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. So this day was the start of the church and, and the indwelling or the coming and indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus had instructed his believers to stay in Jerusalem and wait for the comforter and the power from on high. So we read in Acts 2, 1, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole place where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled. So we'll talk why this is important and how it is relevant to the Feast of the Pentecost. So 50 days unto the feast. So, so this word mimics the year of the Jubilee. So you know the year of the Jubilee comes after seven periods of seven years. So that's 49 years. And then on the following year is the 50th year, the year of Jubilee, the year of liberty. So people are released from their deaths. So there is freedom, there is redemption. So Pentecost is a bit different because it's on a day scale instead of the year. But seven lots of seven days and then on the 50th day was the day of Pentecost. So this day too was the day of liberty, freedom, and coming of the Holy Spirit. So let's move on to the wave offering of two loaves and two lambs. So the day of Pentecost was not only about the coming of the Holy Spirit, it was the birth of the church. So it is the believers making up the church that are represented by the two loaves. So, but why do you think there are two? The two loaves speaks of the two groups of people that make up the church, the Jews and the Gentiles. If you see in 1 Corinthians 12, it's uh, 12 and 12 and 13 says that we are baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we, bond, we are bond or free. So we have been all made to drink into one spirit. So now talking about the lamb. So this was not required when the unleavened bread was waved before the Lord in that feast. Why is that? Because that represented the Lord Jesus who had no sin. But two lambs were offered in this feast as a sin offering at this time, showing that both groups of people, Jews and Gentiles, are accepted through the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. So then let's move on to solve the uh, mystery of the leaven being included in the loaves as well as fine flour. So the two loaves included two specific ingredients that we have now mentioned, the leaven and the fine flour. So why include leaven for the first time? So because the wave offering of these loaves speaks of the Jews and Gentiles that make up the church and they still have sin. So that's why leaven is included in the sacrifice of the lamb. But it also has fine flour. So fine flour is a type. 
that describes the righteousness of Christ that is evident in our new nature. So the amazing truth is, as believers, we know we have we have a struggle between the old and the new nature. So there is still leaven, sin from the old nature, but there is also fine flour, which depicts the righteousness of Christ. So this is the feast of the Pentecost. So next we come to the prophetic, the prophetic fulfillment. Another point is the special Sabbath on the day of this feast. So God wanted the, this day of Pentecost to be a special Sabbath, no work to be done. So we know when we obtain salvation, it is through the grace of God, it's the gift of the Holy Spirit, it does not come through works. So all works must cease and the gift must be received through only His grace. So Titus 3, 4 to 7 mentions, He saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. And He has given us rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, having been justified by His grace. Works means works we do to earn our own righteousness. We'll stop. So, the his, now, we talked about the Pentecost. Now, let's look at the historical significance uh, of this to the, the Jews. Uh, so, we know what happened at Mount Sinai. So, this is where the law was given. So, Mount Sinai was was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on its fire. So can you see a similarity in the day of Pentecost? So there was fire. And Exodus 20, 18 says, Now all the people witnessed thundering, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet. So Jewish believe that these thunderings were actually God speaking in different languages and declaring on Mount Sinai. So that was their belief. Um, so in Exodus 32 mentions that Moses threw the tablets out of his hands, breaking them into pieces at the foot of the mountain. And, and it says, after all this, what happened was the Levites did as Moses commanded, and that day about 3,000 people died. So you know what happened on that day. So looking at the Acts, looking at Acts. Two, fulfillment of the Feast of Pentecost. So you can see suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. So you can see here how uh, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? So here again, there are multiple languages that were being spoken. And Acts 2.41 says, those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added um, on that day. So in contrast to giving of the law, where about 3,000 people died, on the day of Pentecost, about 3,000 were saved. So isn't that a great uh, happening? And see how God fulfills it in the New Testament. So what do we learn from this? So this reminds us of the incredible importance of relying upon the work of God's spirit to both enter and live in live the Christ life. So Galatians 3.23 tells us that we should not at all costs, we should not make the error that the Galatian church fell. And you can see how Paul rebukes this. And um, if we compare the new covenant that which we have received and the law of Moses, you can see the new covenant. It was the Holy Spirit that came to us and is indwelling in us. Whereas the law of Moses, it was a law. And it was new covenant is written in our hearts and the law is on the tablets of stone. New covenants brings life. And in Romans 7.10, it mentions that law brings death. The new covenant is, a, is the spirit, is, it's a ministry of glory. The law was a ministry of death and condemnation. And in the new covenant, blood of Jesus through the new covenant speaks a far better word. The law was based on sacrifices. Um, so in summing up this feast, the first, uh, we have seen that the feast of weeks or Pentecost was fulfilled to the exact day as well like the previous feast. 
and then we have seen how god calendar and then things get more interesting from this point forward so up to the time of the pentecost it has been fulfilled and the first pentecost there were signs wonders and the presence and god gave his law but 3000 died and when the first pentecost for church there were signs wonders and presence of god and god gave his holy spirit and 3000 were saved next we move on to the feast of the trumpets so here in in our generation we will be uh, we will be experiencing and we will we might see the feast of these feasts being fulfilled so coming back to the timing of the feast now you can see we are in the gap period the church age maybe we are towards the end of the church uh, age and we are moving to the fall feast that's the autumn feast trumpets atonement and tabernacle so before we go on to the trumpets looking at the church so we are baptized into one body and we are together as in acts 2 42 to 47 a fellowship of believers and uh, god has ordained us and we are to be expectantly waiting for his coming so paul writes in ephesians that reminding us again the source of the victory and he tells us to be filled uh like it says here do not get drunk on wine which leads to debauchery instead be filled with the spirit so here in the greek tense it's to be filled in a continuous action so we are it's not a one-off occurrence so we are being filled uh, so that is how it is and then once again now looking at now if we talk about the end time or the eschatological event we are once again a remnant like in the day of pentecost gathering together in one accord just like the original day of pentecost where the nations were against the lord's cause there were politics politics economic and religion uh, uh, religious leaders so now we are as believers we need to be increasing in prayer and we believe that doors can never be shut to the fire of god and the visitation of the holy spirit so now we move on to the feast of trumpets so this is the rapture uh, and so let's before we go on to the uh, the trumpets i would like to emphasize here now we all know that leviticus 23 describes the all the feasts so up to leviticus 23 verse 21 uh, uh, verse 21 ends the Pente uh, feast of pentecost feast of trumpets begin in leviticus 23 verse 23 there is this small verse that is in between these two feasts the pentecost and the trumpets which is leviticus 23 verse 22 which says when you reap the harvest of your land do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest leave them for the poor and alien i am the lord your god so we can just say that this is a general instruction and that god cares for the poor and he cares for the people outside of the israel but because this chapter is prophetic in nature there must be a prophetic uh, application for our lives so between the spring and fall feast there is a gap of over three months that we i showed you in that picture so this is the gap so prophetically this gap speaks of the church age that began at pentecost and will conclude at trumpets so what did god do during this time he did precisely what he told israel to do he remembered the poor and alien the foreigner and the stranger and he sent his word to the far ends of the earth so that the gentiles could be saved so now this age still continues today it is the age of grace and it shall continue until the day when the trumpet sound and we believe that we are very close to the time for the fulfillment of the feast of trumpets so let's look at uh, this feast the feast of trumpets the bible commands 
the concern in the fees, if you see Leviticus 23 to 20, uh, 23 to 25, very little is said about uh, the Feast of Trumpets. So it just mentions that it's a seven day, uh, it's in the, uh, other than the starting time and it, okay. So the starting time is the first of the seventh month Tishri. So I, you remember I mentioned the month Tishri. So they have said it should be commemorated by the blowing of trumpets, not much else is given. So to do some work and to learn about the Feast of Trumpet, we need to go to Numbers 10. So looking at Numbers 10 verses 1 to 10, you can see here what are the instances these trumpets are used. So I have highlighted here to use them for calling the community, that is one. Then when you go into battle, we use the trumpets, sound a blast on the trumpets. Third, at times of rejoicing, that is during the feast. And then the fourth, um, you are to sound the trumpets over your burnt offering and fellowship offering. So the four main reasons for blowing the trumpet were these four. Assembling the whole congregation together, setting out to a new destination during the time of rejoicing during war. So they actually used the shofar um, when they said blowing the trumpet. It is very interesting to now look at, now this is a bit of a technical kind of an explanation. If you look at this um, timeline of events, so the there's a thing called the days of awe. So feasts of trumpets, I told you, we started in on the Jewish month of Tishrei. It was a two-day feast, so on day one and day two. Because the feast requires the signing, sighting of the new moon, and then the sighting had to be reported to the priest, and there was some kind of an uncertainty, uh, they celebrated this feast over two days. So those are the two days, Tishri 1 and 2. Then from that day onwards until this day 10 are collectively called the days of awe. So they are the most solemn and holy days in the entire Jewish year. And in fact, there is an entire previous month that they prepare for this. So that is, uh, they start, uh, uh, the previous month, they kind of start a 40 day period uh, they call it Teshuva, meaning repent or return, which concludes on the Day of Atonement. So this is day 10. In, uh, so then what happens is during that preparation time, what they do is they go and blow the horn, the ram's horn, to remind the people to return to God in preparation for the coming days of awe between the Tishrei 1 to 10. So everyone had to search their own hearts during this period and make sure they were right with God. So how did this feast go, going to be fulfilled in our life? So, so recap, so there's Tishri 1 and 2, and then there's these days of awe, and then the last day is the day of atonement. So Tishri 1 is the feast of trumpets, so which depicts the rapture. And then there is the great tribulation that comes and then there is the, the final judgment. So if you can, uh, and then I, if you look at this corner, the Feast of Trumpets, uh, the, the Jews have uh, named, they have different highlights, meaning they call this Feast of Trumpets different names. Day of Awakening Blast, Day of Judgment, Day of Remembrance, Coronation of the King, Opening of the Gates, the Last Trump, and the rapture and resurrection. So, so you can see here in the Jewish history, they called all these names and these names uh, are in the Bible, which refer to the rapture. So I have taken a few of them. Uh, for example, they call it Yom Teruah, day of awakening blast. So you can see Isaiah mentioning here about the rapture. So they believe, the Jewish belief was that in that resurrection of the dead will occur on the Feast of Trumpets. This awakening blast is the 
sound that is said to awaken those who have those who are sleeping or those who have died raising them to life so isaiah speaks about this that your dead will live you who lie in the dust awake and shout for joy so at the rapture the trumpet will be heard and the dead will rise so that is the fulfillment and again 1 Thessalonians 4 16 to 17 mentions for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command in the voice of the archangel with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first after that we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them into the clouds to meet the Lord in air and so we will be with the Lord forever so and so we will be with the Lord forever so what an amazing scripture and this is fulfilled in the feast of the trumpet then another word that they use the last trump so Paul was talking about what he mentioned uh, this event was happening at the last trumpet so the last trump was a phrase used at the end time and spoke of the at that time, not the end time, at that time, it spoke of the last great trumpet that occurred on the Feast of Trumpets. So remember, I said that there is a preparation time and they blow the ram's horn. So what they do is on, on the last day, 100 trumpet blasts were heard. And the last one was called the last trump. And this also happened in the Feast of Trumpets. So the last trump is kind of a, like a technical term for the final long and most significant trumpet blast of the feast of the trumpets so paul was saying that the feast of trumpets was going to be fulfilled by the rapture of the church so here we have even further proof that the rapture and resurrection is tied directly with this uh, feast so another term that the jews use is the opening of the gates of heaven so again this is where the gates of heaven are open, so the righteous may come in. So Revelation 4, 1 to 3. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open, and the voice I heard first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once, I was in the spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, a rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. So note the parallels here, so which have listed down. So John saw a door standing, standing open in heaven. John heard a voice like a trumpet as the believers hear the rapture, we hear the trumpet. John heard a command to come up here. This is like the loud command of the Lord at his return. John got to see what takes place after this. So the church age represented by Revelation 2 to 3. And at the rapture, the bride of Christ is taken to heaven, which is the close of the church age. So we are in the church age, and then we know at the rapture it closes. So John was immediately before the throne when he was taken up in the rapture, and the rapture the Lord promises his full will. Yeah, he said, I will come back and take you to be with me and you also will be with me. So finally, I would like to um, mention about the wedding of the Messiah, where again, the Jewish thought the Feast of Trumpets was also tied into the wedding of the Messiah. So the stage, if I explain to you the stages of the Jewish marriage, which has a very uh, tremendous significance for the believer who is part of the bride of the lamb so all believers at present are betrothed to the lord jesus he has gone away to prepare a place for us that is the heavenly jerusalem and he has promised to come again and take us up to be where he is in heaven in the jewish wedding ceremony the groom would come to take his bride into the wedding chamber for seven days and at the end of this time, they would emerge and celebrate the marriage feast with guests and friends. So it shall be with Christ. So that is the uh, Jewish marriage. So Christ shall return for his bride prior to the coming of the seven-year tribulation period. So you remember I uh, spoke about the timeline where 
the uh, where there are the feast of trumpets is celebrated on day one and two so jesus will arrive um will come again to take the bride and then there is a seven year tribulation period that will be on earth which is depicted in the days of awe and then that is uh, mentioned in um, revelation chapter 4 where the trumpet is heard and the command is given to come up here so this is a type of the rapture heavens open again at the second coming of christ in chapter 19 where both christ and his bride are pictured leaving leaving heaven with the wedding supper and feast having been announced so you can see here uh, the revelation 19 verses 7 to 9 for the wedding of the lamb has come and his bride and his has made herself ready fine linen bright and clean was given her to wear blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the lamb and 11 to 17 mention i saw heaven standing open riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen white and clean come gather together for the great supper of god so what does this mean to us so trumpets were used to alert the people of god so as you see um, the personal aspect of the feasts of trumpets are centered on the believer being watchful and ready so it alerts us because trumpets were used for battle the personal aspect also speaks about the spiritual where that the believe, uh, warfare that the believer will be experiencing in these end times um, so there can be attacks upon the believer the spiritual warfare is increasing so we need to watch as god has said watch and be aware of what is happening in this world watch for the coming of the lord watch and guard our hearts because of the increase of wickedness the love of most will grow cold so we must not allow uh, our hearts to be stolen by the enemy so we must understand that there is a full and real time battle going on for our heart and life. And um, so we must be like the wise virgins. So summarizing the um, Feast of Trumpets. So you remember the, can you remember what we talked about the trumpets? Why were the trumpets used? So we looked at four aspects given to us from Numbers chapter 10. So there was assembling the whole congregation together. There was setting out to a new destination at the times of rejoicing that festivities and also to the sound, uh, the alarm when battle was going to begin. So you, you can see here, God is going to call us, call the whole assembly, the whole uh, the believer, every believer, uh, that is one big assembly he's going to call us um, and he will assemble the entire congregation together for the first time so second the heavenly trumpet is a call to set out to a new destination so it, this is not going to be another country uh, another nice place but this is going to be the heavenly promised land which is uh, the glorious uh, heaven it is a city of god the new city jerusalem so then we see the third aspect is fulfilled at this time for the rapture will be a time of rejoicing just as they were uh, rejoicing around the feast so rapture is going to be a rejoicing time for the believer however it is also it will also signal the time for a battle and for those who are still on earth it will be a sound of an alarm for those who are left behind as joel mentioned blow the trumpet sound the alarm on my holy day let all who live in the land tremble for the day of the lord is coming it is close at hand um, so once a rapture happens that the holy spirit is taken up and there is going to be lawlessness so we are approaching the time when the heavenly trumpet will be heard and jesus will be coming soon so let's together run our race and finish the race well for the new day uh, is coming and it will come quicker than we even think uh, so moving on 
Next would be the times we live in. Any questions from? Uh, it has been a long study. We have 10 minutes more. Anything you like to ask for clarification? Times we live in. Uh, very quickly, Daniel's 70th week. Daniel's 70th week. 70 weeks for Jerusalem. So Daniel mentioned a prophecy about 70 weeks. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. 70 weeks have been decreed for you, your people, and your holy city. 69 weeks were together to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Then there was an isolated 70th week. Now these are weeks of years, so 69 weeks would be 483 years, one week, one week would be seven years. So Hiranthini has already shown that after the last trump, and God's people are taken up with the Holy Spirit. It's like a bit of a reverse of the Pentecost, isn't it? At Pentecost, Holy Spirit came down. Now with the trumpet, Holy Spirit is taken up with God's people in whom the Holy Spirit resides. Then begins the 70th week to seal our vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy place. Next. Then during that at the beginning of the week, uh, the people of the prince who is to come will this uh, now in 70 AD, the, after the 62 with the Messiah will be cut off, happened in 33 AD. Then in 70 AD, the people of the prince who is to come. Now, prince who is to come is the Antichrist. So, people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. So who destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD? Who were the people who destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD? Yes. Which nation or which empire? Romans. The? Romans. The Romans. So the prince who come will be from the former Roman Empire, not from the Russian Empire. This is how we identify from where will Antichrist come. Next slide. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering, and on the wing of abomination will come one who makes desolate. So the, the prince who makes the covenant with the Jews will break the covenant also. Midweek. That would be the prep up for the tribulation. Now coming to our, uh, coming to our present predicament with Russia invading uh, Ukraine, I like to look at Joel chapter 3. And Joel is an unusual book. It has only three chapters. First one describes a locust invasion. And Jewish commentators all believe that locust invasions were not merely physical locusts, but they were foreign armies invading. Then Joel chapter 2 has a lot of good promises, ending up with the Pentecost prophecy that Holy Spirit will be poured upon all flesh. Young men will see visions and older people will see dreams. That is Joel chapter 2. Then after all those nice happenings, Joel chapter 3 describes a desperate situation. So Joel in a nutshell in three chapters is describing the whole scenario, ending up with chapter 3. Behold, in those days at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, which happened in 1948, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Now, when you say all nations, you know this is the last war. 
Valley of Jehoshaphat is in 2 Chronicles 20, where Jehoshaphat had a great victory. Jehoshaphat means Yehovah Shaphat, God judges. And the, physically, this is located between Jerusalem and Mount of Olives. Hamajido Valley, where the Armageddon would take place, is located north of the Mount of Olives. Then I will enter into judgment with them and nations of the world are now being enticed to tempted to go to war. Revelation 16, 14 puts it like this. There are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God the Almighty. Next slide. All these nations that are involved in the Armageddon War, including the famous chapter of Ezekiel 38, Gog and Magog, all those names come from Genesis chapter 10, the grandsons and great-grandsons of Noah, the descendants of Ham, Shem, and Japheth. So Japheth, the descendants of Japheth populated Europe. So if you look at sons and grandsons of Japheth, you will find the name Gog, Magog, Rosh, Javan. All those names are there. And in ancient historical documents, we find where they have gone and settled. So Gog and Magog settled in modern Russia. Ashkenaz settled in modern Germany. Javan settled in modern Greece. So all that can be found from ancient maps. All those names are found in Genesis chapter 10 and Ezekiel chapter 27 also. Today we don't have time for all that, but I want to show how the nations are being now provoked to get to war. It is as if nations have got into their head, enough of peace, we want war. Uh, so we are told in slide 25, Joel 3, 9 to 10, proclaim this among the nations. Nations give up peace and prepare for war. Prepare a war. Rouse the mighty men. Let all the soldiers draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am a mighty man. Now, what did you and uh, take from Isaiah 2, 4? They will hammer their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. That's how nations felt in 1945 after the terrible Second World War. And also because of the fear of nuclear bombs, because Hiroshima and Nagasaki were bombed. Now nations have forgotten all this and they are saying to each other, beat your plowshares into swords. That's what Joel 3.10 says. And your pruning hooks into spears. I'm sure just the way I was surprised, you will be surprised. Can nations be saying this? And how did Joel pick up how Putin would feel in 2022 20, February? Their prophets, they picked up the spirits of nations that will say, stop the debt and take. Let's go at each other's throats. Uh, and COVID provoked a lot of this because nations uh, resources have dwindled and people know time is sort of short or time is accelerated. So nations want to do something to get their own. That's a sad state we are in. Uh, so that encouragement to get ready uh, that the last Trump is going to sound. We are in expectation. We are in occupation. We are in preparation. So this is the last harvest after the grain harvest. Before the Feast of Tabernacles, there was the grape harvest. Joel talks of it like this. Joel 3, 13 and 14. Put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come, tread for the wine press is full. The vats overflow for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Have you heard this expression, wine press of God, in any other scripture? 
overripe grapes and a grape harvest. Have you heard of it in another scripture? Yeah. Okay, you have been listening for a long time. Revelation 14, 18 to 19. Then another angel, the one who has power over fire, came out from the altar and he called with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle saying, put in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters from the wine of the earth because the grapes are overripe. So the angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the wine of the earth and threw them into the great wine press of the wrath of God. So that is the Armageddon. And the Feast of Tabernacles would be the millennium in which the Lord Jesus Christ returns. And nations will live in peace for a thousand years with Christ ruling from Jerusalem. His feet will touch Mount of Olives. It is described in Zechariah 14. His feet will touch Mount of Olives. Zechariah 14.4. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley. Half the mountain will move towards the north and the other half towards the south. And all the nations that have gathered against Israel to fight will, will be demolished. That would be also the time of the Gog Magog invasion described in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. Uh, that day of atonement will come for Israel. Uh, Zechariah 13, there will be a fountain will be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for impurity. For their day of atonement will come and Zechariah 12 says they will see the one whom they pierced, isn't it? Zechariah 12, 10, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication so that they will look on the one whom they pierce and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. But Israel will go through much trouble which is called the time of Jacob's great trouble. In the day there will be a great morning in Jerusalem, like the morning of Hadad Rimon in the plain of Megiddo. That's where the war will be. Uh, so Israel will go through much trouble, but a national day of mourning will come when they recognize their Messiah. They will see him in the skies when uh, many all nations have come against them. Nations think they can down Israel, but Jesus Christ comes and redeems Israel. So that in the line of feasts, feast of trumpet, day of atonement, will eschatologically come back in the end time when Israel will uh, see the one whom they pierced. They will accept Christ the Messiah. God bless you. Dinesh, will you lead us in prayer? Yes. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the preparation. We thank you, Lord, for the trumpet calls. We thank you, Lord, that help us to be ready and help our hearts to be pure, Lord, and watch with you, Lord, of the times, of the seasons, of the dates, Lord, the events that is happening over the world, Lord. And we pray that most of all, help us to guard our hearts, Lord, that Christ Jesus will dwell in our hearts, Lord, and that God of peace will sanctify us wholly in mind, spirit, and body, Lord, so that we can face him, cleanse, Lord. We thank you for the study, Lord. Thank you for Brother Alit and Kirantini that brought the study to us. Thank you, Lord, that the word of the Lord come with revelation and wisdom and minister into our innermost being. Lord, and help us to hear your voice. Help us to know the times, Lord. We give you the glory and we give you the praise, Lord. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen.